So hello everyone. What we are going to discuss in this video is about the latest updates in the EAU guidelines 2024, which was published in the last week. So if we look at the prostate cancer updates, there has been a few very striking updates in the latest guidelines. And we are going to compare with the 2023, what are the few changes that we have in 2024. So if we first look at the first change in the guideline, which is on the classification and the staging system. If you look at this, so on the left-hand side, we have the 2023 guidelines. And on the right-hand side, we have the 2024 guidelines. So if you look at the staging system, the basic of the TNM staging will always remain the same because it is an AGCC-based staging system. The grading system based on ISCOP is also the same. The change we have in the EAU is on the risk stratification system. So in the 2023, the risk stratification system, which was strongly recommended, was the EAU risk group into low, intermediate, and a high risk. However, in the 2024, that part has been removed from the guidelines. So it's not that they don't say don't use EAU risk stratification, but since there are different institutes and different centers which are using other stratification system like the NCCN risk stratification system, the Cambridge risk stratification system. So for the first time, the EAU guidelines have incorporated the CPG, that is the Cambridge Prognostic Group five-tire model. So they have incorporated this and the reason why the EAU is not now currently recommending the EAU three-tire system is because there has been enough evidence to prove that the five-tire system, the NCCN based system is probably better in predicting the prognosis compared to the three-tire system. So if you look at the five-tire system, the this is the EAU three-tire, low, intermediate, and high risk. If we compare this to the five-tire system, if you look at this, see the intermediate risk basically has been divided into CPG2 and CPG3, okay? So this almost corresponds to the favorable and the unfavorable NCCN group, okay? This is probably same as the favorable and the unfavorable NCCN groups. So if we have to understand the CPG4 and 5, they correspond to the high risk or the locally advanced prostate cancer, and the CPG1 is definitely the low risk. So the main emphasis was to re-stratify the intermediate risk into two groups, okay, which the NCCN has already been doing this. So what the CPG has done, if we just look at this, it's, I know it's not possible to remember it, but if, I'll tell you a small trick to remember it. If you just look at this EAU low risk, it is CPG1, okay? The low risk is CPG1. Now intermediate risk, you have to divide into CPG2 and CPG3, okay? Now, what is CBG2? The PSA 10 to 20 glycine grade group 2. Okay, if the grade group 2 is present, then you go for CPG2. Okay, and if there is glycine grade group 3, it becomes a CPG3. If you convert this ORs into AND, this becomes a CPG3. So it's very simple. If you look at CPG3, it is glycine grade group either 3. Okay, or you convert all of this into AND then you get a CPG-3, otherwise it's a CPG-2. Now, one more important thing is, what is the basic difference? What was the idea of why the CPG has been popularized? See, the reason is that it's been given, number one reason is the T2 subclassification. So there is a doubt regarding the reliability of the T2 subclassification into A, B, and C based on the DRE findings. So the CPG does not utilize the T2 subclassification method. It only utilizes the T1 and T2 as a whole. So this is one advantage of CPG. Okay. Number two, it is said that the CPG correlates with the overall survival and the mortality in prostate cancer rather than what the EAU stratifies, risk stratification is mainly concerned with the biochemical recurrence free survival. So this is the reason why some school of thought is preferring a CPG-based model as a better prognostic model rather than an EAU model. And so this is probably the reason why the EAU guidelines 2024 has absolutely removed this guideline from the recommendation, okay? Now, if you look at the next change, the next major change is based on the MRI. 
So until now, we have been using an MRI before a biopsy as per the guidelines. But always there has been a controversy whether we are supposed to use it in all the patients or only in certain patients. So the MRI before a prostate biopsy currently has been recommended only when you are suspecting an organ-confined disease. If you're not suspecting an organ-confined disease, how do you know that? You know it when the PSA is more than 50 and or DRD findings suggestive of a locally advanced disease. In those patients, you omit an MRI. You proceed for a biopsy without an MRI. This is the first major change on the MRI recommendation. So don't have to go for an MRI in all the patients. Just go for an organ-confined disease. So if the PSA has been more than 50, avoid an MRI, straightforward, go for a biopsy. Again, when you are not expecting an organ-confined disease, you don't have to go for a systematic biopsy. You can go for a limited biopsy, which means two core, four core, or six core biopsy. So there are certain centers who are practicing this. Now the EAU start recommending this. Now this is going to be more widely practiced because uh, it serves the purpose. So if you are getting an advanced or a locally advanced disease, you are not required to do a systematic biopsy. You can just proceed for a limited biopsy. What is the meaning of a multiparametric MRI suggestive of positive, negative? So until now, we were aware that if it's a pirate 3, 4, and 5, 2023 would used to say it a positive MP MRI, less than equal to 2, 1 or 2 was considered as negative. Now, what does it say? Negative still remains the same, okay? It's still the same. It's 1 and 2 is still considered negative. Now, what is important is pirates only 4 and 5 are nowadays considered positive. As per the latest guideline, the pirate 3 is no more considered as a positive. And if you find an MRI positive, then in that case, you proceed for a targeted biopsy along with a perilational biopsy. So it doesn't recommend. Previously, it was recommended a targeted plus a systematic biopsy. Now they don't recommend systematic biopsy. They recommend targeted biopsy and perilational biopsy. I'll come to this perilational sampling. Why it is being uh, suggested by the EAU nowadays. Now, let us understand what is pirate's fee then. The pirate's fee is being considered as an indeterminate pirates, okay? And the clinical suspicion of prostate cancer is low based on the PSA density, then you don't have to consider a prostate biopsy in those patients. So when there is a pirate's fee, determine the PSA density, comes out to be less than 0.1, don't go for a biopsy, okay? So when there is a pirate's 2 lesion and you suspect like of the PSA density is more, like more than 0.2, in that case, go for a biopsy. So this is important. We'll come to this again. For the timing, let us try to understand the perilational biopsy and why it is being important. So the perilational biopsy says that you need to take three to five cores for proper sampling in an MRI-detected lesion. So if an MRI finds out that this is a right low and there is a lesion in the right low, this concept says that you don't have to biopsy the contralateral lobe, which is not affected by the malignancy. You only have to take targeted biopsy from the lesion and you need to take perilational sampling, okay? The perilational sampling numbers have been reduced. Why don't you need a lot of numbers? Why? Because it is said that if you suppose you take a, suppose this is the lesion and if you take a radius of 15 millimeter on either side, this is going to detect more than 90, 95% of the malignancy. And that is going to be clinically significant prostate cancer detection. So within 15 millimeter of the radius, so you don't have to go beyond it. Okay. Now, even if it is pirates 3, let's suppose it is a pirates 3. Even if it is a pirates 3, then 16 mm of the distance is sufficient to be detected clinically significant. Because if you go farther away from the lesion, you are more likely to detect a non-significant cancer. So that is why this concept of perilational biopsy is being emphasized in the latest guideline. However, this is based on a meta-analysis, which was published in 2022, which does not say that this is a superior technique. The targeted biopsy plus a perilational sampling has been compared to a targeted biopsy with a systematic biopsy, okay? And this doesn't say that this, which is being practiced, which is being now uh, emphasized by the EAU, this is not superior, this is rather not inferior, okay? And that is the reason probably 
you decrease the number of cores significantly from 16 and a half to nine and a half without affecting the cancer detection rates. And therefore, this is being recommended nowadays. You go for a perilational sampling with a target, not a systematic biopsy. Okay, but this is only for when you are doing an MRI, when you are considering an organ confined disease. So again, coming back to PIRATS2 and PIRATS3, okay, PIRATS2 and PIRATS3. So when there is a PIRATS2, very less likely, this is a negative, but certain PIRATS2 lesion, when the PSA density is very high, it can have 18% possibility of a cancer. So in those cases, you go for a biopsy. Certain PIRATS3 lesion, when the PSA density is very less, less than 0.1, you don't need to go for a biopsy, okay? You avoid a biopsy in them. So this is important and uh, this was there since the last guidelines also, but now it has come into the recommendations. This is table is taken from BJU, Shoots et al. 2021, very important, very, very important table. Coming back to the staging, okay, it's regarding the metastatic workup, we always knew that the low risk disease does not require a metastatic workup. We don't have to do any staging investigation after that. For an intermediate risk disease, you go for at least a abdominal imaging and a bone scan, okay? But now the guidelines are also saying that you can consider a PSMA PET scan if you have the facilities. Previously, the PSMA PET scan was considered on at uh, something which lacked evidence. It was considered superior, definitely more accurate in local staging metastatics workup. However, there was lack of evidence, but there is in the current guideline, they don't mention any lack of evidence because we have enough literature now to prove that you go for a PSMA PET scan staging straightforward in patient with a high risk disease. Okay, alternative is an abdominal imaging and a bone scan. So PSMA PET scan is being recommended now as of standard staging investigation, and you don't have to consider it as something which lacks evidence or something you cannot predict the outcome on the treatment changes. Regarding active surveillance, everything remains the same except for one thing that we know that we have to repeat a biopsy every two to three years, okay? This is same, but there are certain scenarios based on this precise free trial where you can consider omitting a biopsy in a patient who is on active surveillance. So a patient with a low risk prostate cancer and a stable MRI, stable PSA density, you can exclude a prostate biopsy, repeat biopsy. This is important. Otherwise, rest of the things on active surveillance is same. Regarding the intermediate risk management, see, we know that uh, it's almost uh, everything is same. The only thing I want to focus is the lymph node dissection, okay? Previously, this was based on the MRI-based nomograms, okay? And if it is value is more than seven, you go for a lymph node dissection. This literature is still there. The only difference in the current guidelines is they don't mention in the recommendations at all about the lymph node dissection, okay? There is no mention about a lymph node dissection in the intermediate risk disease. Why? They are quoting this study, okay, published in 2020 to July. And uh, this says that if the patient has a favorable intermediate risk, it's only one to point two percent of the patients who are likely to develop a lymph node metastasis. Now, if it is uh, unfavorable, then also it is less than five percent of the patients developing a lymph node metastasis. Okay, so if you have to at all go for a lymph node dissection in a intermediate risk disease, consider for the core positivity number of core positives, like if. 12 cores are taken, more than 50% are positive. And if any core is more than 35% positive, okay, or if there is any genetic factor unfavorable, go for lymph node dissection. This is something that the EAU quotes now in 2024, okay? You still, in your practice, can use your MRI-based nomograms, but unfavorable factors like this are probably an indication for lymph node dissection, but they are not recommending in uh, intermediate risk. You can still consider based on the nomograms, based on this literature, which says which are the patients likely to have lymph node mets in patients with intermediate risk. High risk. What is the change in the management for the high risk? See, radical prostatectomy previously, you could wait for at least three months in a high risk, but you this waiting is not recommended now. You cannot wait. However, in an intermediate risk, you can still wait for three months. This is same. And even uh, this waiting period is considered optimal for even in an intermediate risk. But in a high risk, you don't wait for three months anymore. Okay, that's been removed from the guidelines. 
Another thing, see, regarding the surgery, lymph node dissection, everything remains the same. Okay, we go for it. But when we are considering radiotherapy in a high-risk patient, in those patients, apart from an IMRT, VMAT, and an image-guided radiotherapy, everything is same with an ADT. There we can offer a focal boosting. And because MRI can now detect a lesion, you can target that lesion with a radiation as well, provided the risk-benefit ratio. You have to compare that, and then you can even offer this. So this is a weak recommendation, but this is something new that you should know. Coming to the metastatic CA prostate, we have already had a lot of changes last year, but now this year there is no change in the management of metastatic CA prostate, okay? We are aware of the PS1 trial published and after that initiation of the triple therapy and the, why the triple regimen is being used now. And that still remains the same. The only thing in the germline testing is, you know, previously every metastatic CA prostate used to undergo germline testing. Nowadays, it's only recommended for men with uh, what you are planning for targeted treatment. So if you're planning a targeted treatment, go for a Burka mutation assessment because you might be planning for a PARP inhibitor or Olaparin. In those patients, you require a mutation specific screening. Otherwise, you cannot start the therapy. So if you're planning that, then only you go for it. Okay, so this Burka mutation is being now coming into the guidelines, which was not there previously. Last few slides commenting on the bone protecting agent. Previously, only with CRPC patients were advised to go ahead with the bone protecting agent. Now, only all the patients with the metastatic CA prostate are advised to go ahead with the bone protecting agent to prevent pathological fractures. And if you look at the follow up, everything is same. The one point that has been added in the follow up is so if the patient is receiving a combination of an ADD, Okay, if a metastatic CA prostate is receiving at least a combination like a docetaxel and an ADT, even in those patients, you need to offer bone protecting agents to prevent pathological fractures, which was only previously considered for a, mainly with a CRPC. This is now being emphasized even for a metastatic CA prostate on ADT combination. So this is the change, grossly changes in the EAU 2024. The most important change, again, I want to highlight is this MRI-based biopsy and not to do an MRI. And the pirates 3 has been removed from the positivity. It's been considered as an indeterminate and the emphasis on the perilational biopsy. Okay. And the first time they have added the CPG scoring system in the EAU. So this is all about the guidelines update. We'll come up with more updates on the other oncology parts. Thank you so much for this.